Um, and he was talking about attention deficit disorder in children and it reminded me of when I was a little girl and was so terribly misunderstood and so disorganized and um, it was really wonderful. So I'm expecting great things from today. I'm glad you're all here. Um, I, I wanted to just let you know that um, just a couple of upcoming programs Starting on the um, 24th of June, we're going to be starting our summer reading program. That's for adults and children and teens. The adult program is going to be a um, program where you um, read a book and do a review that we can actually use in the book. We have little bookmarks we put in there. Um, and also on our website. And for every book that you read and review, you get a, a, you get a little um, card or a little ticket. And um, then you can, we'll have a raffle for various things on um, usually Paul's Pasta, um, area restaurants, area shops, um, usually something like you know, one of the bakeries and um, the bookstores, big store books. Um, we don't have the, the, the prices chosen yet. But then on, on September 7th, we're going to have a, a program on Colonel Ledger by John Stewart. And John Stewart it writes the columns of the day. I don't know if anybody has read his work before, but he's a historian and writes a, a column for the day and is an expert on, on Colonel Ledger. So, that we have coming up. And um, last thing I wanted to call your attention to, you see Michael's books. We have his books. I know he would love you to buy a book. Um, if you, you would want to read it first before you purchase it, we do have one copy on the shelf, so you can just ask, um, ask us and we will um, check it out to you. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Michael. Thank you. You're welcome. So, good morning, everyone. You may think it's afternoon. I think it's morning because I woke up a little over two hours ago because I was up until five o'clock last night working, just had breakfast. But it's okay. Me being tired won't affect me because I am a cyborg. Who else here is a cyborg? That's because you don't know what cyborg means. So cyborg means a human who's augmented by technology, using technology to, in their daily activities, to increase their powers. So if you, for example, had something that connected you to a global network with all of mankind's knowledge that controlled your schedule, communicated with people you met, reminded you of things, taught you how to do anything you needed to do, and entertained you, then you would be a cyborg. Anyone have one of these? Cyborg. No. What's the opposite? What's the opposite of a cyborg? C-Y-B-O-R-G. So we're going to talk about how you can become a better, stronger cyborg today. So who here has ADHD? That's what? ADHD. I mean, if you were never diagnosed because you're too old. That's fine. Because <laughs> <laughs> you didn't exist when I was a kid. Yes. You're not too old. I, I've been diagnosed. They'll you at any age. Yeah, and the actual test is a series of questions. So it's not like a blood test or obstacle course for it. You don't need to. Unless you want medication, that's a whole different thing. I've never had medication for ADHD. Because of the second question I'm going to ask. So who considers ADHD a disability? All right. That is a common belief. It is not one that I hold. I've had ADHD for as long as I can remember. I was diagnosed at 20, pretty sure I probably had it before then. Don't know, wasn't diagnosed yet, but the symptoms were there. And once you get to know what you're looking for, you don't really need a test. You can be like, oh, yep, that is it. And high-functioning autism is similar. When I meet people, I'm like, yep, there it is. But the difference is that a lot of people see it as a disability because that's what the stigma is. Anything different from the norm is wrong. Difference is bad. You know, if you have a disability like ADHD or dyslexia or autism, then you end up leading a less successful life. You know, but let's think about some people who have these kinds of these kinds of disabilities, like Richard Branson. He's never really done anything. You probably haven't heard of him. Uh, he's got dyslexia cripples, and he can't get anything done. Uh, some people say Elon Musk is on the autism spectrum. Again, you've probably never heard of him. He hasn't done anything of note. I mean, other than <laughs> inventing a car company, changing the way we, we spend money, and yeah. in yeah. 10 or 15 years putting us on Mars. Other than that, he really hasn't got anything done, because, you know, disability is a great one. 
And if you look at all these people who have these disabilities, disabilities, you'll see that, uh, sorry, we're going the other way. Look at all the people who have changed the world. You'll see they have these disabilities. I have interviewed dozens of highly successful entrepreneurs, multimillionaires, uh, real estate investors, coaches, inventors who have ADHD, dyslexia, autism, other things. And they've only been able to be successful because of what they have. Not in spite of it. They didn't overcome ADHD or dyslexia or autism to do it. They did it because of that. Uh, a story I'll share with you briefly is uh, Dan Mangana. Dan Mangana is a money mindset coach, a multi-millionaire real estate investor. He is single-handedly rebuilding the economy in some parts of West Africa. He, cr he created a uh, an organization which is generating profits, the profits all feed back into it, basically a self-funding machine that's rebuilding entire agricultural sectors of parts of countries. He has autism. If it weren't for his autism, he couldn't have done any of this stuff, because his autism lets him see, who here seen The Matrix? The movie The Matrix, anyone? Okay. So you know when Neo like, sees all the green letters? That's kind of how he is with business. He'll look at a business plan in five minutes and be like, yep, it's good, put a million dollars in it. Or, nope, fix this and this and this, get back to me. Most people take hours, days to analyze it. He's like, yep, there it is, because his brain works that way. He walks by a warehouse and he's like, oh, those pallets are worth 10 times what they're being sold for at the oven button. Boom. The challenge is, the disability side of it, is that he doesn't have the mechanism, the technology, the processor in his brain that reads faces, reads expressions, reads that irrational human stuff. So he did get ripped off a few times, and he managed to become a millionaire, lose it, become a millionaire, lose it, multiple times, before he found out what his challenge was, what his kryptonite was, and be able to manage it. But that can be managed once you know what the downside is, because the Without that downside, you wouldn't have the upside. Without the upside, wouldn't be changing the world. Now, why am I going into this? Because you came from an organizational workshop. Who came from a motivational pep talk? Who came from an organizational strategies? Okay. Because all the organizational strategies in the world won't help you if you think you're disabled. If you think you can't do it, you won't do it. Nothing I'm about to tell you is magical. It hasn't been studied for hundreds of years. I don't have a research team that did this. I got rid of that disability thing, got rid of the shame around ADHD myself, which I, as I probably mentioned, I have, but I don't remember because I have ADHD, so I don't know what happened three minutes ago. <laughs> I got rid of the shame around it, and once that was gone, then I was able to say, okay, now how do I solve this? How do we work with it? Uh, so I'd like to do a little demonstration of the power of getting rid of that shame and, and your beliefs, your self-limiting beliefs. Um, can I get a volunteer from someone who is much shorter than me? So anyone here is much shorter than me would like to volunteer? <laughs> okay. Alright, so let's come over here. So she is shorter than me, I am taller. Do we agree on that? So what we like to do is touch the top of this frame, this door frame. So which of us do you think is more likely to be able to touch the top of the door frame? Yeah. Equal, depending on what you mean by touch. Yeah, like put her hands up, or touch it with, with the, yeah. So obviously, neither of us can do it. Now, let me add one little difference. Yeah. Hold this. Which of us is more likely to be able to touch the top of the door frame? No. No, not me. I'm not pole. No. That's oh, that's tough. Very tough, yeah. Oh. Go ahead and touch that. But, but I'm so much taller. Why can she do it and I can't? Technology. Technology. Thank you. Yes. But a lot of people. Oh, round right, of applause for a volunteer. Thank you. But a lot of people, they start with that self limiting belief. I used to teach driving, and actually height was a, was a thing. So how many of you, when you're parking, have trouble parking because you can't see the lines around the car? Does anyone else have that challenge? Mm -hmm. Okay. Can anyone, who can see the lines 
around the car when you're parking. Like the actual lines of the space you're in. With the back, well, you have with the back camera. <laughs> okay, but without the camera, who can look out the window and see the lines of the, the lines next to you? You can't. I would. Huh? Well, I thought you asked if you could see it. Yeah, well, you physically can't. The car is in the way. Yeah. No, but you see it before you back right. in. You see it before you back in, yes. Yeah, because I back in. Yes, so that's the technique is you look before you get in. And yeah. so you think you can see the lines because you knew where they were and then the car goes over them and you still know where they are. What I found out teaching driving with people who are 5'3", five, 5'5", five, five, they have trouble parking and they'd say, well, I'm too short to see the lines. I said, show them mine. Unless you're a giraffe with an eight foot neck and can stick their head up through the sunroof or you've got one of those Teslas with the wraparound cameras. Nobody can see the lines in the space you're in. The car's in the way. But people believe that I can't park well because I can't see the lines. Not realizing nobody can do that. It's a limiting belief. I'm too short to be able to see well. I guarantee you, if you think that you have trouble seeing your car because you're short, your eyes are only this much lower than mine, you see everything I do. There's no difference. But you've never been tall in a car. You've only been short in a car, so you think, oh, it's harder for me to see. I can't drive as well. Same thing happens with ADHD. You say, oh, I can't do these things because I have ADHD. And usually that's not a matter of, so I forgive myself. It's a matter of, I am a less effective human being because I have a disability, so I can't do the things. And then on top of that, why should you even bother? Why should I try to line up in the parking space? Because I can't see the spaces anyway, so I'm never going to get good at it. So why figure it out? Anyone else resonating with this line of reasoning? Okay. It was when I got rid of that that I came up with all of this. So I'm going to give you a bunch of strategies I use, but if you just take the mindset piece and I don't give you the strategies, you'll figure out the strategies. As I said, nothing here is, is rocket science. Sorry. Hello, James. How you doing? Welcome to the party. There is someone who is not limited by limiting beliefs. James Burger. What was that? I said, that James is someone who's not limited by limiting beliefs. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Always on the move. <laughs> so, you know, if you take away the shame around it and let yourself do it, then you'll figure it out. Just like with the driving example, when you realize, okay, I can't see the lines, even if other people could, you then compensate. You look at the lines before you go in and then extrapolate where the car is going to be moving based on that. And that is, by the way, the technique we taught. Is similar to when you're driving straight down a lane. When you're parking, you look down the parking space, drive it straight, the car will line up straight. So there's your driving tip for the day. So now on to the tips. So one of the challenges of ADHD is the shiny object syndrome. Everyone know what I mean with shiny object syndrome? It is, ooh, shiny, ooh, shiny, ooh, shiny. Chasing after new things. Mm -hmm. Now, the solution to shiny object syndrome would be to stop doing one. Stop chasing shiny objects. Except for one slight problem. It's an opportunity. Right. Mm -hmm. Gold is shiny, diamonds yeah. are shiny, silver is shiny, disco balls are also shiny. So it's not not chasing the shiny objects, it is not chasing the disco balls, or not chasing the wrong thing. So if you're looking for gold, which is shiny in the ground, and you start digging for it, and then you see something shiny over here, so you start digging for it, and you see something shiny over here, so you start digging for it, <clears throat> they're all gold, but you didn't get any of it, because you didn't actually dig far enough into one of the holes to extract the gold. So I'm gonna to talk to you about ways to, to distinguish disco balls from gold, and some techniques to stay digging, to stay focused, to stay focused on getting through those things. If I could read my writing, this would be a much more effective tool. <laughs> I was trying to make a very subtle one. What's over there? What's that? Ah, yes. So one of the structural neurological challenges of ADHD is less working memory. A neurotypical person has more working memory, so they can remember what they're doing. They're less likely to walk in the other room and say, what's it doing? 
They're not not going to do that. They're just less likely to. They're less likely to get distracted from a project. But they'll still get distracted. And this is why I use the example of, of the tool. So they're still get distracted. And once you have these techniques, what's going to happen is you're now going to be the person with the long pole because the neurotypical person says, I'll remember. Have you ever had a neurotypical, not ADHD friend say, I'll remember, I don't need to write it down, and then forget? You ever seen that happen? But if you know you forget, are you ever going to say, I'll remember, I don't write it down? Hopefully not, because you know you're going to forget. I do it all the time in meetings. I'll tell people, you know, maybe someone calls me up and asks me to do something. I'll say, I'd love to do that for you. I don't have any place to write that down. I'm going to forget. I need you to email that to me. If you don't email me, I'm not going to get them. That's that removing the shame part. I'm not saying, oh, man, I'll try the best I can. I'm really sorry I let you down. No. I'd love to do that for you. Totally willing. I will forget. You need to remind me. This is your responsibility. You do your part. I'll do my part. Versus, I'll totally remember. Don't worry about it. And then forget. So you use the tools effectively. Then you can be more organized than the neurotypical person. Who would like to be more organized than non-ADHD people? Sound cool. And one more thing before I get to techniques. Nothing getting distracted or anything. So ADHD people tend to lose their keys. That's kind of a trope, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. These are my keys. Inside here is the key that came with my car seven years ago. This is the key I got when I moved into my house. Never lost my keys in my life. How do I do that? How do I achieve this magic trick? they always go in the same place. I have a system. Yes. Yep. They're always in the same place. Because if you have ADHD, you will probably figure out at some point that if you put them any place other than the place they go, you might as well just fling them out the window. In fact, if you fling them out the window, then you'll know they're outside. So that's probably better <laughs> than just being <laughs> Whereas the neurotypical person says, I don't remember where I was. Where are my keys? So it tends to be more often the neurotypical person who's looking for their keys, forgot their wallet. Oh, did I bring my, did I bring my ID with me? Because they don't realize that they have that challenge. Once you realize you have a challenge, you can overcome it. So one of the challenges is working memory. We keep track of less stuff in our head. We forget it. Accepting that we have less working memory, we use tools, technology. We become cyborgs. One of the simplest tools is a notebook. Yes? No. Oh. Pen. Pen, yes. Yeah. Without the pen, you have to. Well, yes, you kind of need pen and tool. Well, one of the simplest tools is a notebook. Great thing about a notebook is I can't check my email on it, I don't get Facebook on this. It doesn't take any time to load. It won't disconnect to the internet. It's always there, no matter what happens, right there. I mean, my writing would be bad, so I have to look more closely. But other than that, it's right there. So don't underestimate the power of the simple notebook. I got this from the dollar store, or is it fuck? It's fancy and shiny. Oh no, this is from Molly, it's a $3.99. So I misled you on the cost of my tools. Expense. Yeah. <laughs> But you can get not shiny once in the dollar store for $1.25. Uh, yes. What about having a big calendar and you have appointments and stuff keeping track of that? Yes. I, I was about to say that. The other thing is. A giant calendar. Yep. Yeah, okay. It's putting things where you can see them. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Whiteboards. Yeah, okay. Yep. So Whiteboards, calendars, putting things up where you can see them. And, and it's always in the same spot. Yeah. yeah. When you go. So you, so you know where yeah. for it. And you train yourself to look at it. That's the other thing mm -hmm. is that. ADHD comes with sight blindness, so especially mm -hmm. sight blindness. So if you look at a crowded yeah. table, like if we have a table with a bunch of stuff on it, and I say I can't find my phone charger, and my wife says it's right there, yeah. that's an ADHD thing. That's I, I was about to say that's, that's not a not paying attention thing. It is a not paying attention thing. It's an ADHD thing mm -hmm. that our brains, our filters are turned up too high. So you need to train yourself to look at the calendar. Mm -hmm because you will otherwise ignore it, but you can train yourself, if you know it's there, 
to look at. So I have a whiteboard right over on the wall behind my computer that has all the goals I'm working on right now. All things I want to remember. If I'm working with a number of clients, I have the clients. The upcoming events, I run virtual events. All the upcoming events and the dates of them are up on that whiteboard. I have a paper calendar so I know the dates. I have two monitors on my computer. The second monitor is usually Google Calendar. So I know exactly where I am. So not saying I'm not late for meetings, but when I am late for a meeting, I know I'm late for a meeting. It's not like, oh, I forgot I had a meeting. If I'm, if I'm working, my calendar is right there, so I'm constantly aware of it. Recognizing that the other thing it needs to come to is timeliness. And you see, one of our things is that we can start working at one o'clock and suddenly at six o'clock, what happened? Alien abduction? No, just timeliness. But when you have a calendar next to you, you're aware of what time it is. You may not remember looking at it 10 minutes ago, but that doesn't matter because you just have to know where you are right now and having that tool. So it's all about having, um, having things highly visible. Now I will put the, the asterisk, asterisk for intersectionality. ADHD, our filters are set too high, so we won't necessarily notice things. Autism, the filters are set too low. So if you have autism, you notice know everything. So some people are doubly lucky and have ADHD and autism together. So your mileage may vary on the solutions. Whiteboards could be a great answer or they could be an atrocious answer. Yeah. I heard about a, there's a company that specifically hires autistic people to debug software code because they can go through pages and pages of code and they, you know, if I'm going through code, I'm never going to, I could look at one line and tell me just narrow this line and find it. I'd be like, I don't know. Whereas they go through pages and pages and pages, like, oh, on page 37, line <coughs> 5, you're missing a period. So, but the problem is they can't not see things. So the neurotypical boss who brought this team together, they went into a conference room, they're working on a project. And so to his mind, because he was probably ADHD, because he's the guy who said, let's get a bunch of autistic people together, deep by code. ADHD people are very creative. And he's like, I'm gonna put everything up on the walls so that we have it all easily available. And one of the team members needed to take a break like every 30 minutes, like lay down under the desk, cover his eyes. And he said, what's wrong? He said, this stuff on the walls, I can't not read it. So it's like having someone yelling at me constantly while I'm working. So I'm just pointing that out because one, you could be ADHD slash autism. So some of these things have opposite solutions. Um, but this all comes back to removing the shame around whatever your neurotype is. And if you can't have text on the walls, don't have text on the walls. But if it's for the type of ADHD I have, which I think is relatively common, Having everything out in front of me is very helpful because it keeps me focused on, on what all I'm doing. There's different types of ADHD. Yes. There's different types of everything, really. You know, no two people are the same. But, so what a, what a neuro, actually, I'm glad you asked that question. So, we're going to diverse like that. So, what a neurotype is, a diagnosis, diagnosis is when a doctor gives it to you, a neurotype is saying, this type of brain. So for example, are you, are you guys familiar with the Mystic, Mystic Knowledge Library? And you're familiar with the Bill Library? No. <laughs> are you familiar with the Public Library? So all three of those are the type library, but they're different, right? Mm -hmm. Two of them are the type association library. That's the right term, right? Association library. And the other one, I think municipal library is the term mm -hmm. for it. So two are the type association library. So if you were to wake up from a coma in either the Bill Library or the Mystic Knowing Library, would you know which library you were in? Or would you say, well, these are so identical because they're both association libraries, I can't tell them apart. They're similar, but they're different. But they're still in the same type. So if you were to have a convention of association library directors, they'd have a lot to talk about because they have similarities. But one might be one room, one might be 10,000 square feet, one might be a modern building, one might be an old building. There's differences, but they have a lot in common. A neurotype is similar. If you get together 100 people in ADHD, they have a lot of things in common. But they also have a lot of differences, different upbringings, different education, different neurology. But the point of it is that you can share these ideas. I have ADHD, these things have worked for me. You have ADHD, there's a good chance they're going to work for you. 
So instead of going out of the clinical model of you have ADHD, so you're broken, so let's see if we can fix you, it's you have a similar situation to what I do. I've done some things. The things I've done might help you. And so that's why we categorize, and that's why labels are good, but they are not prescriptive. It's not like, well, I have ADHD, you have ADHD, it works for me, it should work for you. Now, there's some differences between me and any one of you. There's a very obvious difference between me and most of you. In case you have that. Uh, and so those differences in neurology, age, gender, health, uh, education, will all weigh into it, but many of you could probably benefit from putting up a whiteboard and keeping your most important things to remember on it. One or two of you, it might give you a headache. So recognizing this has helped a lot of people who are like me, but not everyone. Does that make sense? So, um, yeah, so that's, that's one of the, the key points when dealing with things like ADHD, especially because it's been stigmatized for a long time. It's been seen as a disability, as a mental health condition, as a learning disability. And even when they use euphemistic words like learning difference, does anyone think learning difference sounds good? Because we all know it's a euphemism for disability. That's why I like neurotype, type is a pretty neutral word. This is what type you are. You know, I drive a Honda Civic. That's not a judgment on it versus other cars, but if I'm gonna, if I'm going to replace the headlights, I kind of like to know what type it is. You know, if I go to the auto parts store and I say I need new headlights, and they say, "What kind of car do you have?" I say, "I don't believe in labels." Well, I'm gonna have trouble replacing the headlights in my car. <laughs> the labels are pretty useful, but it's you know I could then say I drive a Honda Seven. It's it's not an Audi, but it's what I drive. That's putting the judgment on it, but just saying. I drive a Honda Civic. That's what it is. So, um, okay, yes, so lists, so the, so the idea of lists, whiteboards, anything like that, that is moving your memory outside of your brain and into technology. Now, as you mentioned, technology only works if you use it. If I put all my notes over here and I never looked at them, wouldn't do any good. So you need to actually use the technology you have, which means putting systems in place. and it may happen you put a system in place and it doesn't work the first time. You, know, you say, okay, I'm gonna make an action list. And you write it all down, you put it down, you forget to look at it. This does not mean action lists don't work. This means your first iteration of trying to use an action list didn't work, you should try it again. So, no, again, remove that judgment. The first time you try something, it may not work. It also may not work for you, but it just may not work the first time, you have to try a different one. You have to change your habits. Reapproach it. Sometimes it works for six months to change your habits. Stop for me. Yes? I just kind of something to offer about like, the listing. I can write stuff down on paper and it never gets done. Mm -hmm. But if I put it in a note on my on my iPhone, I'll see it. I'll do it. Yes. Like, that, that's, that works for me. So if like, anybody here finds they are, are always using slips of paper or they can't find their notebook or they just don't look at it, it may be part of their phone too. Yeah. So I have a, I guess, an I do a lot of stuff, and it's hard for me sometimes. I do make lists, and I like crossing them off, mm -hmm. and I like doing what you're talking about with these poems, I just delete them. Yep. And it makes me feel satisfied in doing that. Yep. But instantly, when I have like an idea or we're doing something, so you know me, so I own many different videos, yep. and we do a lot of stuff. And for me, it's hard to not delegate, because I'm getting better at that, but like if I have a great idea in my head and I want something done, it's hard for me to write it down. Like I'll think about it a million times, I'll go and do it, but then if I wanted you to do it, when I go to write it down, I kind of like freeze, and then I get distracted, and then I just don't do it. Mm. Like on the paper, like I'll still do it, but I wouldn't be able to delegate it, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I always had, like my family's always told me I had like an issue with that, because like when I do an event or something, I have everything planned in my head, and then I can't really do it until I'm there, and then I'll be like, hey Mike, can you go move that there? Hey Joe, do that, and do this. And like everything works flawlessly, but I guess it hinders everybody that's coming to help because right, they don't yeah. know what's happening. And I don't mean to like make them not know what's happening, but it's hard for me to like write it on a piece of paper and explain it, if that makes sense. That's an interesting, I'm going to write that down and we'll come back to it. So a couple things I'm gonna say that sort of bear on that, um, but I'm gonna write it back down. James writing things down. So that's before I get too far, Gabriel, because I said I'm gonna touch on a couple of those points. And one of the ideas is self-delegation. So, yeah, 
I'm glad you brought that up with the lists and the slips of paper and whatnot. Don't write things on slips of paper. Again, that's like writing these up with them. You will lose them. You will not remember to look at them because everything has to be about processes, systems. Uh, you know, I have, there's about 11 things in my house that can't move. And if they move, I'm like, everything's broken. Because I have processes that I just like picking things up, not looking at them. You know, my, my wife cleaned the, cleaned the bathroom. She's like, oh, I put a new you know, tooth, toothbrush caddy. Drove me nuts. Because I go in to do my end of day routine and I reach for the toothpaste, toothbrush, and it's not there. <laughs> I reach for the toothpaste, it's not there. Maybe right here, but it's not there where I'm reaching for it. So I have to use executive function, another thing we were low on, to reprocess, okay, it's not there, where do I get it, where do I need it? So, you know, so the slips don't work, but that's why I have a notebook. This notebook sits next to my computer. And I have a process for how things get into the notebook. Because if you just put things in the notebook as you think of them, they will be in the order you think of them. And if you try to execute them in the order you thought of them, then you will very quickly say, well, these aren't the right order. I don't need to do this, I need to do this, I need this. And now you're using executive function again. So you want to put your executive function into as small a package as possible. And so there's two concepts I want to talk about. One is creating, it is treating yourself like your own employee. So you've heard of be your own boss, which a lot of people think be your own boss means not having a boss. When I say be your own boss, I mean actually be your own boss, think of yourself as two people. And in Jesus' case, you actually have employees that you need to delegate this to. So that's why I think some of this may be relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, but the exercise is to think of yourself as your own employee. So if you had a remote employee, how would you work with them? You wouldn't just say, okay, yeah, do that and come back. I mean, you might, but you shouldn't. You know, if you had a remote employee and you communicated with them by email and you want to spend as little time as possible communicating with them and just have them do the work, you wouldn't say, come back to me, you're done with that, and I'll tell you the next thing to do. You'd say, here's your objectives for the month, here's your objectives for the week, here's what I want you to get done today. So I have this concept of three a month, three a week, three a day. So you come up with three things you want to do for the month. You send me bigger things, you know, finish writing my book or do my taxes or um, launch the new project or whatever. And then for the week, three things I want to get done this week. Hopefully three things that work towards the three things for the month. And then, down to three things per day. So this is a quick and easy form of prioritization. Because you can get three things done. Three is not that hard. And if you do three things a day, that's 15 things a week. Which means 60 things a month. Which means 720 things a year. If you get 720 tasks done a year, you're probably going to be pretty productive. Having to like write down the three things for the day every day. To try and be that organized. Okay, I'm gonna have three for the month, three for the week, and three for the day. I mean, that would last a very short time for me. You know what I mean? I'm glad you mentioned that. She's not actually a plant, but it perfectly well sets up for the next more advanced strategy that I use, which is the master action list. So the first, so this requires having goals. You have to know what you want to do, like where you want to be in three months, a month. You figure out where you want to be, and then you say, what projects would I need to get done? Projects basically anything is multiple actions. What projects would I need to get done to get to that thing? So, give me an example of a goal you might have. Taxes. Get your taxes done. Okay. So, complete your taxes. Yeah, so complete your taxes by the end of the quarter. Uh, so within that project of uh, complete your taxes, so, so that, that the goal of the project is the same. You know, get your taxes done, the project is complete your taxes. Within that, there's a set of actions. Gather your receipts, um, I don't know, gather your receipts, find your W-2s, do some other stuff, send it to your accountants, and you have this list of actions. And so you make these lists for all the things you want to get done. So you make a list of like, hey, by the end of this quarter, 
I want to get my taxes done, I want to um, prepare a talk for the library, I want to write, get a blog up, I don't know, five, six things, whatever it is, could be more than three. And then all the action, you look at that list, and you say, if I get that list of things done, oh, pretty good. If I get nothing else done, just get those things done, I'm pretty excited about that. Then you write down all the actions, you'll take get all those things done. Then you're going to take those actions and you put them in a spreadsheet. And then with a spreadsheet, you assign each of these actions to dates. I've experimented with putting it into a week, putting it into a day. You can experiment with what dates you put it into. But the point is, because you made a list of all the things you want to get done in the end, and then a list of everything you'll take to get those things done individually, you can now take this list of actions, put them into a big list, and then in the morning, when you say, I'm going to do something today, you take your notebook and you've got your blank page and you're like, uh, what am I going to do? Instead of needing to use that limited executive function that we have, you go to the list. You ask your boss, hey boss, what am I doing today? Your boss is the spreadsheet. And you pull the items from there and you put them on here. So you don't have to think about what to do. You know what to do. It's already been determined. And the process was already done in such a way that if you get all these things done, you know you're going to be in a place you want to be. And if you don't get all the things done, you get some of them done, you're still going to be in a good place because you've gotten a bunch of those things done. And so this eliminates the stress and the challenge. I'm glad you brought that up. If you're just trying to do three things a day, and every morning you're trying to say, okay, what are the three things I need to do today? Sometimes we're in a high executive function state. Sometimes we're not. And if you try to plan when you're in a low executive function state two or three times, you will throw out that solution, as you said. And that's what's happening, is that when you're feeling good, you're excited, you're pumped up, you've got the, the dopamine, serotonin, whatever the neurotransmitter is, you've got lots of it, you're like, yeah, I'm excited about this. And then two days later, you don't have so much of it. You're like, this is stupid. So by getting all the planning done when you're in the state to do it, then it means that you can relax, and so you wake up Wednesday morning, and you're kind of like, okay, what am I doing here? Oh, all right, I need to email Bob. I need to email Bob. Oh, I need to get my receipts together. Okay, I get my receipts together. You can just follow the instructions and not do that part of the thing, which is figure out what you need to do. Uh, and so, so now, if you do this, you're going to have a list of things to do every day that you pull off the master action list. But when you have a list of things to do, what often happens? You get distracted. Mm -hmm. So this is what the quick list is for. So I recommend that when you make a list, you put it in the middle of the page. And so something will come up. You say, oh, I got an email off. And you go to your email, and there's an email from Susie. And you're like, oh, I should reply to Susie. Nothing gets done if it's not on the list. But you say, I need to reply to Susie right away. You write, email Susie at the top of the list. And then, your next action goes on top of the list, which is email Susie. And if you then say, oh, I need to email Joe, but not right now. Bottom of the list. So what this does, by keeping it on the list, what I call the quick list, is it means you're still always on the list. Even if you're distracted, you made the choice to say, I'm putting this at the top of the list. The thing you were about to do is still on the list, it's just next. The alternative is, okay, I need to email Bob. Oh, no, wait, I need to email Susie. Oh, no, wait, I need to email Joe. Oh, no, wait. And you have now opened three tasks and completed zero tasks, which is why it feels so stressful, because in your brain is thinking, I'm doing all these things. But you haven't actually done anything. You simply started thinking about doing things. So by using the list, again, it's taking that limited cache RAM that we have in our brains, putting it in the advanced technology, and then using this to tell us what we're going to do next. Uh, and you can do this any great, every, any level of granularity you want. So you could have like send emails, or it could be email Bob, email Joe, email Sue. It could be write email to Bob, hit send on email to Bob. Whatever level of specificity you need to work for you, you can experiment. Uh, experiment using that, but that will keep you focused on what you're doing. And, and you know, and the reason I, I mentioned the idea of that employee-employer concept is if you think of it as me as a worker 
I'm like a remote employee to me as a boss. The boss is sending the messages, say, on Sunday. Sunday is your planning day. It's when you get up and you drink your coffee and you're in a relaxed, open state of mind to receive new ideas. And that's you do all your planning. So the boss then emails the employee who's you on Monday and says, here's what you're going to be doing this week. Um, and the other example I make the boss analogy is, who's ever had a boss give them instructions and make any sense and then do them anyway? Anyone ever follow a boss? And so the boss says, do this, and you're like, why? And they're like, I'm the boss, do what I say. And you're like, okay, you're the boss, whatever. Anyone ever had that situation? You can do that with yourself, too. Because oftentimes, you're like, well, it doesn't really make sense to email Bob before I make lunch. But boss says email Bob first, so email Bob first. Because if you spend all that energy deciding what should I do first, which task is more important, you're going to get less tasks done. It's better to get more of the, the medium important tasks done than spend more time figuring out what the most important task is to get done. And so if you simply look at it, it's like, well, the boss told me to do it in this order. Okay, well, this is the order of the notebook. Yes, I better follow it. It's what my boss said. Um, so, and the other thing you can do is create SOPs, standard operating procedures. Now, SOPs are generally used for large organizations. So if you work at McDonald's, there is a process for everything. How you open the register, how you make fries, how you receive the shipping, because they've got a million, gazillion employees, and they want to make sure that everyone does everything the same way. I imagine in a smaller institution, like you know, the library, I imagine you know, processes for how to open, how to close, how to put books away, things like that, because there's more than one person, and they want to make sure that anyone who does it, does it the same way. Well, you can make SOPs for a team of one. When I run my virtual events, I have made a document that tells me what to do in what order. So that way, I don't skip steps. It's kind of like creating that action list, but for things you're going to do over and over again. So you're always going to follow the same process. So if there's something you need to do, like, for example, taxes. Tax is a great thing to do an SOP with because you may have done great last year, and this year you may have say because it's been a year since you figured out last year. So if you have that document, this is how I do things, then that's going to help keep you focused on doing all those things and not skipping steps, because that's one of the stressful things when you have ADHD, or if you don't, is am I missing something? Am I missing something? Am I missing something? And the more you worry about if I'm missing something, the more you're going to get distracted and the more brain space you take up with that, and the more you're going to miss things because you're worried about missing things. So creating those, those SOPs for yourself can be really effective. Uh, and it can help keep you focused. And again, reduce the strain on your executive function and on your brain. And what else have I not mentioned yet? Oh, yes. So when you're building the master list and putting dates on things, there are tasks that should go on the list, and there are tasks that should go on the counter. Any, anything that's going to take more than two hours, you should put in a calendar spot. So if it's email Bob, that goes on the list, because that you can do in probably 10, 15 minutes, maybe less. If it's, uh, I don't know, gather up the receipts, your receipts are in 19 different shoeboxes around the house, that goes on the calendar from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. on each day. Uh, if it's, you know, write, write all the copy for my website, and that's gonna take three hours of dedicated focus, that goes on the count, 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Thursday. Because if it's on a list, let's say you eat lunch at noon and you've got a call scheduled for 2. So you look at your list, the next thing on there is write all the copy for the website. It's 11 o'clock. You're like, well, I can't do that in an hour. Okay, what's next? Uh, I'm not sure if I want to do the next thing. Does that, uh, okay, what's next? What's next? Oh, maybe you should do, oh, maybe you should do this. Maybe you should, maybe you should do this. Let me check Facebook and see if there's anything important happening there right now. Because once you go back into executive function mode, you have reopened the entire discussion of what you were doing. And you could do anything. The world is your oyster. Oysters make bad worlds. So you want to limit your options, you actually stay focused to get things done. So by taking the big things off the to-do list, you won't trip over them and say, oh, this is too big to do in the time I have left. Let me start refocusing. Um, the other way you can go wrong if you have big things on to-do list is you just skip them and don't get back to them. Because you say, okay, yeah, I'll just leave this, y'all get to it when I have three hours open. Most of us don't have, you know, three hours just happen to be open. 
Or you do up three hours open, you're like, yeah, I'll be up three hours. I don't know if I'm really in the mindset to do this right now. Maybe I won't do it that time. So big things you want to put on the calendar is they get done at the right time. And oh. See, I wrote down this nice summer song. Yes. So if you put the big thing on the calendar mm -hmm. and the little things on the to-do list, yes. then you don't put the big things on the to-do list? Correct. You put them on the master list. So the list that says on June 5th, I'm doing this, this, and this. So you can cross it off the big list, but you'll then put it onto the calendar. Which, uh, I'm actually glad you said that, because the other thing you need to put on your calendar is time to work on the little things. You don't put each individual thing on there, but you put a block that says work, because otherwise you'll discover that there's no time to do all the things on the list. So you want to make sure there's time designated for the next thing off the list that you're going to through. Um, and yeah, it depends on what your calendar looks like. My calendar fills up with appointments very quickly because I'm a professional connector, so I do a lot of one-to-one -one meetings. So if I don't block out work time, I just meet with people continuously and then never follow up with them or do anything else because I'm just meeting with people. So I need to block out that time. Your schedule may not be as intensive as mine, but just make sure there's some way, some time when you will pick up the list. This gets into the systems. Sometimes you pick up lists that, hey, it's time to pick up the list, what's next on the list? Boom. So you always want to have those prompts that get you to do that thing. Um, and the other thing I want to talk about is uh, differentiating the gold from the disco balls. So you want the shiny objects that are gold, not the shiny objects that are Um, so how many of you are entrepreneurs? How many of you are employees? Retired. How many of you are retired? Okay. Um, so this concept I developed for entrepreneurs, but it may be relevant for others, so I'm going to share it with everyone. You can take what you want. It's like a potato bag kids. So a concept that I came up with was the overarching mission. So, you know, we have your goals. I've got goals. I want to make money. I want to support my daughter. I want to be healthier, etc. And when you just use your goals as a test for what you want to do, what projects to take on, you will discover that many projects will move towards those goals. So if I want to make more money, and James, you may uh, resonate with this, if you want to make more money, I could make more money writing books. I could make it teaching courses. I could make it cleaning houses. I could make it giving talks. I could make it doing an affiliate program. I could make it, you know, there's all these different things that are all over the place. And it's very easy to say, ooh, I can make money over here. Ooh, I can make money over here. Yeah. And then you never actually yeah. land on anything because you're constantly chasing. Yeah. But they achieve the goals. You know, I can get healthier if I remove weed from my diet. I can get healthier if I run. I can get healthier if I go to the gym. I can get healthier if I run up and down the stairs. I can get healthier if I play softball. But if I run halfway after each thing, none of them actually get the job done. So the concept of the overarching mission is identifying what your kind of what your wheelhouse is. So I, I used to, um, and, and you know, it can evolve. This is my story. I used to be the guy who knows a guy, which I actually should think back. And the book, the guy who knows a guy. So I was a network of guys making connections. So I only did things in business that had to do with making connections. Same thing with anything that doesn't involve making connections. So it was a pretty broad mission. You know, I looked at myself only the things that involve humans, which is like all of business. So I was chasing all over the place. And then I narrowed in, say, okay, I'm the virtual event guy. I run events, I, I do things as something with virtual events. So I'll do MC services. I'll run virtual events. I'll do uh, I'll help people run online courses. Yeah. So it narrowed it in so I could look and I could say what fits into this space. And the trick of this overarching mission is to find something that's big enough that you won't get bored inside it, but small enough that you can look at something and say, yes, that fits. No, that doesn't fit. So people will come to, people come to me all the time and say, oh, you're well connected? Well, I've got this amazing program that saves corporations money on their electricity bill. And just connect me to CEOs and you'll make a whole bunch of money. Well, that's great, but 
I don't talk to a lot of CEOs and I don't work in the corporate space and it seems like a lot of money, but it's not my aligned audience, so I'd have to build something for the speech. So to figure out what is that thing that fits what you are doing in a bigger picture, not simply, you know, not simply like, I am a, you know, use your example. Like you're saying, I'm a DJ, I just do DJ stuff. Well, that's too narrow. You're gonna get bored. And and you get bored, you throw the whole thing out, and you're like, ah, and you're back up to the end. Yeah. But if you say, you know, figure out something broader with it, like I do, I think if I knew all of your business, I could probably come up with a circle that encompasses it all. But you know, you look at the things you're doing, you really like doing, and say, what do they all have in common? And now look for more things like that. So it's not just matching one tree, it's matching many traits. So, you know, whatever that might be. Um, and and the, it might be around, say, you know, you're a DJ, but you also do planning services, but you also do design, but you also do interior design, because they're all related. Or it might be, I find projects where I can hire people for a modest amount of money and then charge a much larger amount of money. Um, and different kinds of services, which includes hosting parties, planning events, cleaning out houses, junk removal, landscaping. Um, so a lot of things that seem like they're all over the place, but the common thread is I can find people with, and give them little training and they can do the work for me. So it's finding that common thread so that your everything you're doing makes sense somehow. Yes? Uh, wouldn't you uh, want to find the need for that to, to be done? Like you may have a great plan, but if there's no need to, uh, in the corporate world, or yes, you, you would definitely you want to make sure need, but find but, the need. Uh, but I say once you've identified, yeah, once you identify this is an opportunity, this opportunity yeah, exists. Okay. Should you chase it? Because there's a million opportunities. Yes. Um, to kind of answer what you're saying, so I own six different businesses. I do a bunch of different things. And what Mike was just talking about, they're all different industries, but they're all something I personally like to do. If I don't like to do something, I would never do it for the money. Um, but to answer what That's you were just asking point. about, yeah. usually uh, what I find personally with entrepreneurs and most small businesses fail, are you guys hear the numbers? What are the numbers, Mike? You probably might know. I, don't, I think they said three out of five. I don't know what the number is, but it's a, it's a high thing. The problem is what I see personally is because Everybody thinks, oh, do I look for the opportunity? No, you just do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you, if you want to go do something right now, go do it. Right. If you really enjoy doing it, you're gonna make money on it. It doesn't matter. You don't don't worry about paying. Yeah, I, I think mean, that's what sure. kills a lot of businesses because yeah. everybody goes and they pay for the market research, they go for the advertising, yeah. they go for, hey, what do you think? But her thing is different than yours. Mm -hmm. So like, if I just enjoy doing what I do, some days I don't make money on something. I mean, well, that would happen today, but. But when I first started, some days I didn't make any money. We were just broke even. But I enjoyed doing it, and then I figured out how to make the money after failing so much. And I was like, oh, okay, we're not charging enough. So now people will pay more. And then we have some of our businesses, some of our competitors, they charge 10% of what we charge, right? And I thought, oh my God, that was gonna kill us. But nobody wants to pay that 10%. I mean, we all want to, but when you realize you find somebody who's really high quality, you'd rather pay that more money because it's higher quality, excuse me, higher quality and it's just the experience because that 10% dude is probably gonna ruin your house or, you know, I mean, that's speculation. But mm -hmm. you think about it, you're like, insurance versus, ins like, without insurance, everybody's like, well, if I save 100 bucks, he doesn't have insurance, that's cool, but then he burns your house down. Now it's like, oh my gosh, how do you get it? He obviously has no money because he has no insurance, right? That would be kind of like that. but. What I find personally with just doing it is just doing it. You know, like if you have an idea, just go do it. Worst thing is you're failed, but I mean. I've uh, operated too many uh, not for profit, <laughs> but to enjoy the what you're doing, like I did renovations. Mm -hmm. yep. And if people found out you were dependable, and, uh, or if you weren't able to make it, you called them. It, it was always something that. Yep. Uh, keeping them in contact. And you imagine, just referral. I had people up and down various streets when I was at uh, Utah that I worked for, and they would only accept me, come over and, and advise. Yeah, well, and, and to, to James' point too about 
figure out what you're what you're good at and want to do is a lot of times when we learn about business or we talk about you know Amazon, Facebook, all these places where their addressable market is the population and they're trying to capture most of it. None of us are likely to ever be in that situation where we need noticeable percentages of the entire population. So if you're looking to make you know, a million, so I, I used to publish, publish Mystic Neighbors, which is a magazine that goes to Mystic and Stonington homeowners. And people was like, oh, it just goes to those 4,000 homes, such a small area. And I computed, and I may be remembering the math wrong, I believe that those, just those 4,000 homes represent something like $600 million of buying power. Yeah. So if you want to make a million dollars a year, you just have to redirect one six hundredth of their spending. Now this includes all their non-discretionary spending. Their, you know, their mortgage and their taxes and insurance and whatnot. But some of the target audience for the sponsorship, for the advertising, was mortgage companies and realtors and the people who get money from non-discretionary spending. So if you want to make a million dollars a year, you could do it just in Mystic if you can get them to redirect one six hundredth of their total spending to you. So you know, niches can be very powerful. If you can find something people are willing to pay for, there's, you know, you don't have to say, is there a need? There's, someone has a need. Mm -hmm. And you can sell 10,000 products, you know, to make a million dollars, 10,000 products for 100 bucks each, or 100 products for $10,000 each, or one product for a million dollars. So, you know, one thing I often tell artists, when they say, oh, it's so hard to be an artist. I, I don't know why rich people don't patronize the arts anymore. And I say, have you asked? There's someone out there who's making $70 million a year and can't draw a straight line, but thinks art is really great and wishes they could make it. Well, all they have to do is hand an artist $60,000 a year, put them up in a little apartment in the like, place over their garage, and say, you are going to be my artist. My name goes in everything you make because I'm your patron, and you are going to make art. And this is a rounding error on their money. They can totally do it. The reason they don't is because no one's ever asked them. Now, am I saying every millionaire is, is ready to go hire an artist? Absolutely not. Is some? Sure. So that's one client fulfilling your total needs and just figuring out that it, it can be done. And it's not a matter of like doing market research like, hey, which one of these millionaires wants to hire an artist? It's saying, I want to be a kept artist. How can I make that happen? So start from what you want to do and what you can deliver, and then figure out who you can get to do it, and you know move at it with that with that level of conviction. Um, so to get back to your question, which I I glossed over some points vaguely relevant to that, just but not the core point. Um, so you said the challenge is when you say, "Hey, I got an idea," then you go write it down, and you're like, eh. um, "Does it work to say it out loud?" Yeah, so I have an assistant now, so it sounds crazy even when I say it right now, but at the end of the day, I'm usually tired, so like mm -hmm. I have an assistant who will sit there and I will just talk to her. She writes everything down. And I find it a lot easier because I have the ideas, and then one, she's pretty pretty um, interactive, so she it's kind of like a focus group for me. Mm -hmm. So like if I say something, she may be like, oh, that's too crazy, or oh, I like that idea, but I haven't thought about it this way. So I like that a lot because when I would write the stuff down, I'd, I'd freeze. Like all day, I'd think about all this stuff, and i do it, but then it's like, I want to get home to write it all down, and then I can't write it down. Like, yeah. I don't know how to explain it. Like, I don't know if it's just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a lack of motivation. I think it's just my brain. Like, yeah. I don't take medicine for my ADHD or anything, so and I feel like I don't want to take it. Probably figure your company's got a business with your medicine. So. Yeah, honestly, that's why I, I, I feel like you said earlier, like I think ADHD people are very creative. Like I think that's what our, you know, our curse is. We're thinking about stuff all the time. Yeah. But I think the benefit is we're like superheroes because I don't even know how other people think. And sometimes I have a hard time understanding that because I'm like, that makes no sense. But <laughs> what I've learned is we all think differently, you know? And like, like you said, like I don't really like how society is saying that it's like it's such a big yeah. But I think if you benefit, you benefit from it because you are thinking a million times faster than the average person. Yeah. So now you can have a million more opportunities than that one person mm -hmm. because you're always thinking. But yeah. now the problem is, like you said, execution. Would you go for the disco ball? Do you go for yeah. the gold? I just go for whatever I want to do. So 
But some days I go for something that I didn't make much money on, but I enjoyed actually doing it. And some of my family and people I know are like, James, why are you wasting time doing that when you can do this and make 10 times more? But for me, my life is about fulfilling mm -hmm. what I want to do. And if I have an idea, I don't not do it. I just do it. Yeah, well, and, and so uh, uh, a couple things on that. So, you know, sometimes in our typical people are like, yeah, yo, how, how do you live with all those thoughts bouncing around your head? And uh, I sometimes say, how do you live with so few thoughts in your head? Uh, I interviewed someone who, who, instead of neurotypical, says neuroordinary, or sometimes neurophoric, depending on how smart he is. Because it's that idea of, of, you know, how do you live without the constant effluvians of ideas flying out of your head constantly? Isn't your life so boring just doing the same thing every day and being satisfied with it? But, so, one thing you, you did say when you first described your solution was you started by saying something like, this may sound crazy or this is crazy or whatever. Uh, so I challenged that part that get rid of that, everything else is good. And the other thing to keep in mind is until very recently. I'm sorry, get rid of the, this sounds crazy. Get rid of this sounds crazy. Right? Yeah. Because okay. everything else is great, and that's exactly what you should be doing. And I was going to, I was actually going to suggest technology solutions, assuming you didn't have an assistant, because a lot of people can't hire an assistant. Um, but if you have an assistant, that's the answer. It's having a human who can sort of catch it and. Well, I did the whole recording thing with that joking, not, so I couldn't listen to myself. Yeah, I mean, that was even worse. Yeah. Than, like, well, so, so now, now AI transcription is so good that you can record into something like a script that'll put it into text, and you can hire a VA, a VA in the Philippines for five dollars an hour to take that text and turn it into instructions. Well, I also tried tech, text to talk in order to yeah. talk in text. A, a, in the last six months, it's been a huge. I have to look up the yeah, better app because yeah. Yeah. it would like do every other word would mess it up. Yeah, I would go read it and be like, oh my. But God. the other point I want to make is that until very recently, you couldn't run a business by yourself. Like thirty years ago, nobody ran a business by themselves. They had a secretary, they had a bookkeeper. You know, the smallest, simplest entrepreneurial business was three or four people. So this, like, so when people say things like, every, you know, the average entrepreneur. New business fails in three years, five years, whatever. I'm like, I don't even know what fail looks like for me because if the project fails, I drive more Uber, but it still can cardio LLC. So, like, if that LLC fails, it's because I died or I got a job. Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's no business failure concept, but if you have a secretary and a bookkeeper and you have to rent a room and you've got overhead, then yes, you can certainly fail at that point. So entrepreneurship is totally different, but that also means it used to be you'd have one or two coworkers. You'd have someone who bounced ideas back. You'd have someone. It was perfectly normal for every entrepreneur. In fact, think about 50 years ago, most business owners couldn't type. You want to send a letter, you'd say, take a dictation for me. And then you'd start talking, and your secretary would write your letter for you. Like, type your letter, and you'd just speak it out. That was perfectly normal. And the idea of an owner typing their own letters, it, you know, Frank just be like, are you a secretary or a business owner? What are you doing typing a letter? You don't have to do that for yourself. So technology is made it so we can do everything ourselves, but then we've lost a lot because you no longer have one or two people on your team. You no longer have that that bouncing back to you and that um, you know someone to say, are, are you sure? You know, if you're sending a letter and you're like, take a tissue break, dear Jack, <laughs> your secretary might say, are you sure this is the wording you want to use? I mean, your thoughts. Are you sure? And they're like, oh, okay, no, maybe not. But you buy yourself an email. Yep, there's no one on the team. There's no one to stop you. So this idea of working alone, we have this concept of the lone wolf. That is an island. But this is very, very new. And really, our entire life as we know it is four generations. Uh, our idealized world of what America should be like and work and everything. There's people who were born before it existed. Like, it's that new. It started in the 40s and 50s and was over by the 80s. And then our modern way of doing things, some parts of it are less than 20 years old, some parts of it are less than 5 years old. So there's all these like, this is the way it's done. It's been done since three years ago this way, so we must always do it this way. Like, the, the way it's always been done is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So everything is changing. Everything is going to change even faster, especially with AI now. Mm -hmm. uh, technology is going to change everything. 
people are making, whatever you're worried about about AI is probably the wrong thing. And whatever you're not thinking about AI is probably what's going to kill us all. So don't worry about AI because it's probably going to kill us all in a way you can't possibly imagine. So in the meantime, figure out what you can take from it and what the benefits are and remove that judgment and just say, I'm going to do some awesome things. I've got a brain that's configured a certain way. I'm going to use it to do awesome things. I live in an amazing world of technology where things are constantly changing. We're riding the rapids through time at a time when the rate of change is increasing exponentially. And so just roll with it. Let that judgment go. How we've always done things doesn't work anymore. How it's supposed to be done doesn't exist. I've worked with, as in my networking concierge role where I make connections with people, I work with people who are our coaches. They sell online courses, and there's something called a launch model where you get a bunch of partners who promote to their audience that comes into your thing, so you sell them and so on. And there's this way that's always been done, and this company's making hundreds of millions of dollars, and they are the grand luminaries, and they know it all. And their sales are all down 70%. Because everything changed, some of them realize that they're pivoting, others just say, yes, the market's just changing. So there is no old way of doing things. Look at the biggest company, you know, 20 biggest companies. I'm pulling statistics out of the air, but it's for illustration. Many of the 20 biggest companies didn't exist 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. Tesla, SpaceX, PayPal, Facebook, Google, Microsoft. Yeah. yeah. A lot of these biggest companies, they didn't exist 20. And I don't know if you, many of you probably remember when Microsoft was ruling the world, we had to have an antitrust case against them, and we gotta break that, you know, Microsoft stranglehold on the industry because they're they're too powerful. That was 20 years ago. Now they're like, and they're still a major player, but they're the bottom rung of the major players now because all these others came past them. And then Facebook, oh Facebook's got everything. Ten years from now, Facebook is gonna be where Microsoft is. Because there's that they, they get big, they get cautious. And they fall. So, because they do things the way they've always done them, always since 2004. So, be open to these new ideas. Remove the judgment on what works for you. Remove the judgment on how you work. Accept it. And if it works, never say, this is crazy. You may say, this may sound crazy, but it's a great way to get attention at the beginning of something you want people to listen to. This may sound crazy, but bear with me. But remove that judgment of like, it's kind of crazy how I do this, but what I do is, if it's working, it's not crazy. So it's crazy that it works, and it's crazy that people aren't listening to you and copying it. So we are past an hour, and it's set an hour, so I'm going to set you all free, but I'm not leaving right away. So if you have questions for me afterwards, by all means, I do have a, a gift for you all if you would like more support, guidance along these topics. I do a weekly group coaching call called the Lightning Coaching Call, something called Laser Coaching, which is um, small mini coaching sessions. My Lightning Coaching, because I think Lightning sounds dramatic. It's one hour a week, group coaching call, where you can come and ask anything, because I've got ADHD and I'm a networker, so I know a little bit about everything. But I don't know a lot about anything, but I know a little bit about everything. So if you are interested in getting one month of free access to those calls, you can go to summits.fun slash gift. That's summits.fun slash gift. And if you missed that, ask me afterwards, I'll write it down for you. Uh, I do have copies of my book here available for sale, and it's also available taken out from the library. They have it in there on their stacks in the, in the fancy new book section. I took a picture, it's really cool. I have that there. Uh, and I do also, if anyone's interested, I do also offer private coaching. Know more about that? Again, you can ask me. You'll see me right here. Look for the guy in the purple shirt. Oh yeah, you probably know who I am. All right. And with that, yes. I just have a quick question. Um, do you mind if I? If you said it was summits as in like uh, S U M M I T S dot fun dot slash gift slash gift. I can I can send that to everyone. Oh, that would be great. Um, if they wanted to give me their email address, I can send that to you if you. That works too. Yep. Yeah. So, so we. When you go to that form, it'll just ask you for your name and email, and that will send you the access information. Um, and then you'll also get other follow-up info from me, because I share. I share all kinds of stuff, because I can't focus on just one topic, especially my emails. 